Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our fireside chat on machine learning and seismology in the geosciences. My name is Bill Walter. I'm the past president of SSA, and I'm going to be the moderator. I'm joined by an excellent panel of seismological and machine learning experts, so let me introduce them here. Uh, Dr. Carrie Ann Bergen is an assistant professor of data science and earth and environmental and planetary sciences, and an assistant professor of computer science at Brown University. She earned a PhD and a master's in science in computational and mathematical engineering from Stanford University, and a bachelor's in science in applied mathematics from Brown University. She has focused on machine learning and big data techniques for pattern recognition and discovery in large complex sensor data sets, and included uh, in her discussion, uh, research on algorithms for automatically identifying weak earthquake signals in large seismic data sets. Dr. Daniel Trugman is an assistant professor in the Department of Geological Sciences and the Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas at Austin. Daniel received a bachelor's in science from, in geophysics from Stanford University and a PhD in earth sciences from UC San Diego. His research focuses on the analysis of large data sets of seismic waveforms with the goals of advancing our understanding of earthquake source processes and associated hazards. Before coming to UT Austin, Daniel was a postdoctoral fellow at Los Alamos National Laboratory in his hometown of Los Alamos, New Mexico. And finally, Dr. Chinkai Kong is a research scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. He received his PhD in geophysics from the University of California, Berkeley. Before he joined uh, Livermore, he has also worked as an assistant researcher at the Berkeley Seismological Laboratory and a visiting researcher at Google. He is currently working on machine learning and seismology and previously worked on the MyShake project at the Google Android Earthquake Alerting System using smartphones to detect earthquakes. So welcome to our three panelists. Today, we're gonna to take a broad view of machine learning in the geosciences. We're gonna include all aspects of data intensive computing such as artificial intelligence and deep learning. And we're gonna start with a panel discussion. I'm gonna pose a series of general topical questions to the panel and ask each member to take a turn at answering, perhaps with a follow-up question. And then after the topical discussion, we plan to have time at the end to take questions from the audience. You'll be able to type your, type your questions into the chat, but I'd ask you to wait until we reach that point before you start typing questions, as your questions may be answered in the initial discussion. All right, so let's jump in here. We're gonna start with a brief introduction from each of you. So Daniel, we'll start with you. How did you get interested in machine learning? Yeah, thanks, Bill. Thanks for the introductions. Um, I think for me, I've been interested in, in things like data, things like statistics um, for much longer than I've actually been interested in earth sciences. I was kind of the kid that would, you know, love to buy baseball cards and look at the statistics on the back and try and make teams out of them and see how well the teams were doing. So I think for me, I, I've just been a data person for a very long time. Um, but in terms of getting into machine learning, I think it was really in graduate school when I realized that it was a, this was a really good way to kind of merge my interests in data science, in statistics with um, kind of a, a new passion for seismology. And so I thought it was kind of a, a, a good way to, to, to bring all those interests together um, and solve new problems. Um, I think, you know, in those days, it was really kind of a, the Wild West in terms of getting you know, training, trying to learn machine learning. There weren't a whole lot of formal classes on it, um, especially as it applies to earth sciences in particular. So it was kind of a lot of, um, you know, looking at, you know, some of the recent papers, looking at especially like the tutorials and the workshops and the all the online resources that were pretty much free back in those days. And so that's really how I started to get in is just by practicing and trying to learn how the codes work and trying to understand the basic concepts. So it's a lot of kind of work on my own. I think now there's there's a whole lot more formal training you can have, whether it's, you know, workshops through conferences like SSA or, you know, formal classes through your university or, you know, through Google or through other environments, but it was kind of different back then. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. And Chikai, how about you? How did you get interested in machine learning? Yeah, thanks, Bill, for the introduction. Yeah, so I got into machine learning actually a little bit uh, earlier than I went to graduate school. So I was doing a, like a consulting type of work in a consulting company, and they tasked me about like uh, classifying thousands of images manually. 
So at that moment, so we I actually realized the power of machine learning. At that moment, it's also called like a pattern recognition. But then I was admitted to the PhD program at Berkeley, working with Richard on the MyShake project. This is a really great project that get me off from uh, like uh, on the machine learning because we usually call it non-traditional seismology that using the sensors inside the smartphones to detect the earthquakes. We have to address a lot of difficult questions that's difficult to, to uh, formulize using mathematical models, for example, distinguish human activities from earthquakes. So that's the time I started to experiment uh, machine learning models and also get really into machine learning because uh, it's so fascinating that you can think that you can let the computer to learn by itself and then do the decision uh, on our benefits. And also at the, that moment, Berkeley has the big data and data science movement. So essentially these big terms, machine learning, data science, high performance computing is everywhere in Berkeley. It's very hard to avoid that. So that's also the time I picked up all these skills and also went to various kinds of workshops and uh, seminars on the campus and I met a lot of uh, great people who are working interdisciplinary uh, between domain science and machine learning data science. Yeah, I think that's the way I get into machine learning. Thanks. Thank you, Kai. Yeah, that's it. It's in the air. That's a good, <laughs> a good way to put it. Uh, Carrie Ann, how did you get involved in machine learning? And uh, yeah, thanks, Bill, um, and thanks for the introduction. So I actually got into machine learning because my background and training is in applied math and computational sciences. So in applied math and computational science, you study things like linear algebra, numerical optimization, applied statistics, and these are exactly the sort of tools that are, are used in machine learning and data science. So it's sort of a natural transition. Um, especially as, as Chinkai was saying, being, you know, in the Bay Area and hearing all the sort of buzz around data science in these, this area. Um, and so I did my undergraduate in, in applied math. I took an applied statistics course. I had heard of sort of machine learning before. And so my first job after college was actually as a data scientist. I'd never heard that term before, and that wasn't the job title at the time, but I was doing applied machine learning um, at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, where I was um, detecting whether or not a biothreat agent had been released using these sort of specialized sensor networks and using machine learning to determine whether these were real or false detections and trying to characterize, you know, what the release might have been like. And so that was kind of my first experience actually working with machine learning. Um, and then I went into grad school into this sort of data and computational sciences type program and the, the courses, the topics I found interesting were the things like linear algebra optimization, which kind of naturally transitioned into um, into machine learning and, and so I kind of got um, moved more into that direction than I had had expected to. Um, but as an undergraduate, I had also taken a few earth science courses, um, a, sort of spread across several different institutions. But at the time, I didn't really see a connection between my interests in applied math and like how I would actually use that in earth sciences. So it was something that I enjoyed, I liked, but I didn't really see how I would at the time sort of use, um, you know, my sort of mathematical background in that particular field. And it wasn't until grad school and I met Greg Barroza, I started working with him that I sort of came back into earth sciences. Um, so it was always a sort of an interest that I had had um, from, from my undergraduate uh, experience, but then I kind of came back into earth sciences that way. So I kind of started in, in applied math and machine learning and then kind of came into earth sciences a little bit later. Sorry about that. I muted myself. Thank you. That's great. Uh, so let's pivot to uh, talk a little bit about uh, machine learning in the geosciences. And uh, let's start with kind of a, a quick snapshot of where do we think we are now. And uh, we'll start with Ching Kai. Sure. Yeah, I can speak a little bit about like my experience seeing machine learning in our community in the last 10 years. So I started a PhD uh, at uh, Berkeley Seismological Lab. And at that moment, to be honest, at 2011, um, I saw like a scattering machine learning research uh, like in our field. But at that moment, uh, also there's a lot of doubts. People thinking about like uh, what machine learning is and also machine learning is a black box and engineering tool and so on. But uh, with time progress, like uh, I think it's around 2014, 2015, um, 
we actually saw the first uh, like SSA machine learning session. I think it's organized by Paul Johnson uh, from um, Los Alamos. And to the, I was thinking, wow, gee, that's a machine learning whole session uh, oriented for the machine learning research. So really good. I started to see the, the more and more people started to show their research in machine learning. And now we can see that like at the beginning, the machine learning research is mainly focused on face picking and uh, these like low hanging fruit uh, projects. But now it's actually getting more and more advanced and more people interested in using machine learning in various fields like a tomography, earthquake warning, and event identification. And recently we also see like more folks working on integrated physics models into machine learning. So generally I can see that machine learning in our fields right now is like a takeoff and more and more people interested uh, in machine learning now. I think that's the, the general ob observation from the last uh, 10 years. So I will stop here and listen more for other comments. <laughs> Thanks, Jinkai. Yeah, let us uh, let me throw that question to Carrie Ann. Where do you think we are now in machine learning and the geosciences? Yeah, um, so I, I just wanna start off. I, I definitely have seen this sort of progression that, that Jinkai talks about. Um, you know, when I first came into the geosciences, when I first came to my first AGU conference, I was presenting work in like general contributions of seismology number four session. Um, and now it's nice to see all the machine learning sessions and that this is really um, kind of has a home within the conferences. Um, but I would say, so a, a couple years ago, I was trying to think about, you know, how is machine learning being used in the geosciences and coming up with a way of sort of organizing the different uh, uses. And so um, for this review paper that I wrote with some of my, my colleagues, and so we sort of divided these applications into three categories, which was using machine learning to automate a data analysis or make automated predictions, using it for modeling or inversion, and then also using it to sort of discover patterns in data. And right now where I think most of the applications have, have been where they, there's a lot of low hanging fruit um, still is in this notion of autom automation um, and trying to automate your sort of analysis pipelines. This is where tasks like phase picking um, and these other kind of seismic signal processing um, tasks uh, sort of fit in. Um, where the challenge is right now with, with those kinds of tasks is often putting together the data sets, getting the labeled data that you need to do that sort of analysis. And so that's something where there has been a lot more effort placed in the last few years and, you know, really focus on the data sets and getting those and sharing data sets. Um, I think that these other areas, modeling, um, using machine learning, and the notion of using machine learning for discovery are areas that I'm really excited about. I think that there's been more movement into these. Um, so for instance, integrating machine learning with HPC is something that's being done in, for instance, uh, the climate community. I think that's something that we'll see in the geosciences. Um, and also in some other fields, like in um, chemistry and material science, they do things like use machine learning kind of interactively to help them design which experiment to do next. And there's a lot of really cool work there. And so I do think that there's a lot of new opportunities that we haven't exploited, but um, a lot of these um, automation type tasks um, we're getting really good at in the geosciences and getting better data. Um, and so that's what I kind of, I guess my, my summary and I'll uh, that's great. wrap, wrap yeah. up there. We'll, we'll Hear more about these things. Thanks, Gary Ann. And how about you, Daniel? Where, where do you think we are now in machine learning the geosciences? Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I think you know, first order seismology is really a data rich field. There's there's way more seismic data that's publicly available right now than we could ever hope to kind of try and comb through by ourselves. And so I think we're right now we're really at the stage where we're kind of um, using machine learning as a little bit of a tool to try and automate digging through all of that data. And so, you know, you see, you know, roughly every week, whether it's in BSSA or SRL or, you know, the AGU journals, there's a new paper on a new convolutional neural network to pick seismic waveforms. It seems like, you know, machine learning is very good at that. Um, and, you know, some of these classic network seismology techniques that, you know, people have been doing by hand for 50 years, trying to get, you know, um, moving past that to allow, um, you know, the human inspection to, to look at more nuances in the problem. So I think that's really, you know, that's really where I've seen a lot of the success in recent years is just in that automation front. And I think as Karen was pointing out, like the, the, the future we're going to be getting, you know, trying to use machine learning in, in more advanced applications that I think we're not quite there yet. 
Um, I think some other areas where I've seen a lot of success over the past few years, um, you know, machine learning applications and thing like in things like tomography, it's not really my area of expertise, but they've been doing, there's been a lot of progress on that front, um, whether that's kind of more global scale or also, especially at, at the local scale in the seismic, in seismic imaging and in industry, um, there's really a, been a lot of progress there. Not all of that is open, but you know, it's a really um, hot topic in terms of industry research. And so that's kind of an area that, you know, if you're looking for um, employment opportunities, having those machine learning skills is going to be really important. Um, and then of course there've been, you know, there's been a fair amount of application and success in applying these to try and understand laboratory experiments where you have, you know, pretty rich data sets, then you don't quite know exactly what's going on and you can really use machine learning to try and crack open the nut and see what's, what's happening. So I think those are areas where I've seen a fair amount of progress recently. Yeah, that's great. So let me ask a follow-up and be a little provocative. Um, so if you're just, we're pressed um, for what's the greatest success so far, what would you point to? And let's maybe go back to Ching Kai. Sure, yeah. In my opinion, like the biggest success in our field is like uh, probably lies in three areas. One is the like the uh, ultimate, the whole pipeline of detection, face picking, association. We can see a lot of these success uh, from different groups that uh, building the models, building the pipeline that uh, to automate the whole pipeline of routine seismology that uh, reduce the efforts from the analytics. I think this is the biggest uh, um, success I see so far. And then the second part, uh, in my opinion, is that uh, like machine learning actually can, after training, it can really run fast. And uh, a lot of the, there's some of the researchers already show that for the like large scale simulations or like some other time consuming computations that after you train a machine learning algorithm, like that learned from these simulations that you can actually reduce the computation time. And then the third part uh, I was thinking is more related to, um, it, it, it's more related to the, um, to the topic of, uh, um, uh, I can't, yeah, it slip, slip out of my mind That's now okay. of the third part. We'll, yeah, I will stop here, but- uh, We'll come back to you, let you think about that for a minute, but sure, that's, you, yeah. had a, you had a complex answer to uh, being a provocative uh, short question. I'll see, uh, Carrie Ann, what do you, this would you, you say is the greatest success so far? Yeah, so I would say that I think that one of the areas that machine learning has been really successful, and this is kind of related to this notion of automation, is um, you know being able to use machine learning to work to process large, new, complex, sort of unusual data sets that we don't have necessarily an ability to process using traditional methods. So, for instance, Chinkai's work with MyShake, you know, these are sort of very noisy, potentially very large data sets that are sort of unusual, and so these are data sets that you know we don't necessarily have the right, you know existing tools to analyze or new kinds of data like DAS data, where you're just getting a very large data set compared to what existed previously. And so you need sort of new tools. And I think machine learning can be really helpful um, as you know, seismologists start to adopt these sort of new sources of data. Um, and that's where there's been, you know, recently a lot of, I think, interesting work. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and how about you, Daniel, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of the, the obvious answer is, you know, the automated analysis of, the, of seismic waveforms. I think another area where there's been a whole lot of success with machine learning is in understanding laboratory experiments and, you know, understanding, you know, drivers between, you know, what, what can actually be measured in the lab and the physical processes that are going on, um, you know, during these kind of laboratory earthquake ruptures. I think machine learning has been a really valuable tool in um, trying to unpack the experiments and learn something new about them. So, yeah, that's good. So let's yeah. pivot to Sorry, the. I can I can Go follow ahead. up on yeah. that. I now remember the third point. Yeah, Go ahead. I, I'm speaking. <laughs> yeah, I think it like. Uh, it's it's also like uh, related with the pattern recognition, so which means that it really works well on some tasks that uh, related with like. Uh, finding a pattern, recon, recognize a pattern. And I think like a lot of the cases in, in our physics uh, community that uh, some problems are hard to use a mathematical model to, to basically model it. And in these cases that it actually also works really well that to uh, distinguish the different patterns 
from the object. I think that's the third uh, biggest success I was thinking. Thanks. Yeah. So, I mean, let's, let me pivot to maybe the opposite, right? We're all uh, trained as skeptical scientists. Um, what are there, are there places that people are using machine learning that it's not well suited for? And let's start with you, uh, Carrie Ann. Yeah, so um, machine learning is, is a, I think it's a really useful tool for many different applications, but it's not always the right tool for every problem. And so I think it's important that when people are using machine learning that they understand the limitations of the tool and thinking about whether it's actually gonna solve the problem they're interested in. So some examples of limitations of machine learning is these models are often hard to interpret. So if you're really interested in having a model that you can interpret, interpret and make sense of, um, sometimes that may not be the, the best approach. Um, some of these models, when they're trained, they're, the, there's often these challenges around uh, the replicability of these models, um, whether or not they generalize well, these kinds of limitations. Um, and ultimately, machine learning, these aren't, so these aren't sort of magic tools. Like your machine learning is learning a function that learns, it learns a model that can sort of um, replicate what it's seeing in data. So there's patterns in data, and it's learning to reproduce those by creating some sort of a, a function approximation. Um, and so the model that you're learning is really only going to be as good as the data that you're feeding into it and sort of the, the technical skills you have in fitting the, the model. And so this can be a common challenge that comes up with scientific data. If you don't have good ground truth, if it's hard to get these labeled data, if you have um, sort of systematic biases um, when you're sort of collecting or labeling or aggregating your data. And so if you have these sort of issues, if you have really small, for instance, if you have a really small labeled data set, then maybe machine learning isn't the right tool. It may be better to use your domain knowledge to try to come up with an algorithm that, that doesn't necessarily rely on, on having a large data set. Um, so I think some cases I see people trying to use machine learning when they don't really have the data that you need to be able to learn a, a model that would generalize. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a lot of different sort of limitations in, in the design of machine learning algorithms that, um, I, so I think it's not so much that I've seen a lot of examples of machine learning being applied where it's not well suited, but sometimes it's being applied in um, where I think the, the process isn't always thought, well thought through. And so that's something that I, that I see more of. Um, and there's also, I think, a tendency in some cases to use overly complex models for tasks that don't require it. So if you could fit a model with a, say, a linear regression or some simple classifier, you know, and then oftentimes people will jump to the fanciest, most state-of-the-art, a deep neural network with lots of layers when they don't actually have as much data as they need. And so, you know, simple machine learning algorithms can be powerful. And so I think it's also a matter of choosing the right tool for the task and for the data that you have. Um, yeah, that's good advice. Uh, thanks, Carrie Ann. And how about you, Chinkai? How are there places people using machine learning it's not suited for? Sure. Yeah, I think I think yeah. In my opinion, this is the lesson we actually will we need to experience when we use a new tools in our field and also to learn all these basic from from basics of machine learning. So yeah, I I actually built on top of. Uh, uh, Karen's answer, I, I see like a lot of the, the applications like uh, Karen mentioned is that the generalization capability of the model and also like uh, starts from like a small data, data set and then train a more complicated network. It's very easy to get overfitting and you get a really nice result, but then you don't know whether the result is really like the model learns the, 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 the behind physics or it's actually just like a purely remember everything. So I think that's the, 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 the limitation I see of applying machine learning in our field. And also um, I see, I, I think this question also like boils down to the, basically the limitation of the, the machine learning models that people use it before they actually fully understand all these limitations. Um, like, like Karen mentioned, machine learning is not a magic and also like it's, it's usually works well on the data sets that you train, but when it changes a little bit, then it's not working well uh, for the generalization capability. And uh, this is also true that uh, like uh, in a lot of the cases, we can't guarantee the performance of machine learning on the long tail of the distribution. Like uh, on the majority part, we can guarantee that it's working well, but on the long tail, it's kind of like a random, random, uh, uh, random model that uh, gives you the answer. So understand these limitations before you actually apply these mo models in some critical 
tasks will be uh, will be key, in my opinion. Thanks. That's excellent advice. Yeah, thanks, Jinkai. And how about you, Daniel? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I mentioned that seismology is a very data rich field, and that's true. But there are also a lot of really important problems in earthquake science that are very data poor. Um, you know, the, we just don't have a lot of you know on scale near near fault recordings of large earthquakes. And if we had a lot of those, we'd you know we'd have a lot more insight into the physics of large earthquakes. But we we just we just fundamentally are data limited, and machine learning is never going to help you get around um, fundamental limitations in the data. So that's one one area where you know you're, you're not you don't have any hope of you know having machine learning come to the rescue. Um, to help understand. And I think kind of related to that, um, you know, seismic waveforms, earthquake processes, these are all governed by, you know, fundamental, fundamental physical laws. Um, and so kind of the risk with machine learning, if you, if you apply a purely data-driven approach, is that, you know, you're trying to learn from data these very complicated physical laws that people have been, you know, studying for hundreds and hundreds of years. So you're kind of throwing out all of this knowledge if you take a fully data-driven approach. Um, and so that's kind of the risk is that, you know, your, <laughs> your machine learning algorithm is only as good as the data. And if the data hasn't captured the entire suite of physical things that could have occurred, um, then your model's never gonna be perfect. Um, and so that's kind of the, the two main um, limitations. I think, you know, the, the way machine learning is applied in the sciences is kind of a fundamentally different approach than, you know, someone like Google might apply machine learning, you know, with Google, you know, if they're trying to understand human behavior, there's no fundamental physical laws governing behavior. They're just, you know, looking at the data, seeing what people do, and they can get a model and it can, you know, help them make a profit. In in earthquake science, we're fundamentally trying to understand how things work. And so, you know, having that, you know, lack of transparency that Carrie Ann and Shinkai mentioned is is a pretty big limitation in many cases. And so that's that's kind of the risk. Yeah, thanks. So that's a good thoughts, right? You, if you're data driven, uh, you can't really go beyond your your training sets. So let's talk a little bit about sort of frontiers of uh, of machine learning and and ways to maybe go beyond uh, its perception as a black box, and think about are there things like uh, physics layers that could be built into uh, the training? Um, and let's go back to you, Daniel, to answer. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but I think the some of the real frontier areas of machine learning, especially in geosciences, are these kind of physics informed um, machine learning workflows where instead of, you know, taking a purely data driven approach with, a, you know, just fit a neural network to the data and hope it gives you the right answer, you know, use areas, use machine learning in areas where you're data rich and knowledge poor and use, you know, physics based approaches in areas where you're knowledge rich and data poor and kind of use them in complement as opposed to in opposition. I think that's really, really the kind of the area that we're going to see a lot of growth over the next 10 years. You know, we've seen it in other fields. They do this a lot in climate science, for example. Um, you know, you know, there's other kind of spinoff type of work that, you know, using machine learning as a tool to, you know, solve or to parameterize dynamical systems, partial differential equations, things like that. Um, and also, you know, I think Shinkai mentioned this earlier, but using machine learning um, to accelerate either forward calculations or inverse calculations or, you know, unpack the results of these large scale um, physics based numerical models. Those are, um, you know, really important areas. And then I think kind of moving other areas that I see, you know, um, unsupervised learning, we've talked a lot about, you know, the picking the seismic waveform problem, that's a supervised problem, there's training data, there's, you know, labels, things like that, but the, you know, unsupervised learning where you're using it more in a discovery framework or trying to just understand relationships and data, I think there's a lot of room for growth there um, as well. So. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Um, that's a lot, a lot to think about, actually. So let me uh, throw that question to Ching Kai next. Sure. Yeah, I concur. Um, I concur with Daniel's answer, and uh, yeah, especially for the adding physics into into the like machine learning model, as we always say, like a uh, machine learning model as a black box model, 
And these physics laws that are added into the machine learning model can help to constrain the model's uh, perform performance and also the converge as well. But also at the same time, um, that like Bill, you mentioned that uh, like uh, adding the layer uh, physics layers into the model. I see also recently there's like uh, efforts on the implicit layers that uh, like for the deep learning layers, you can add it the like the physics uh, physics model there as long as it's differentiable that you can actually build an integrated model. Um, that's actually a big plus to me as well. I think this is definitely the frontier um, uh, uh, area in, in the fields. And also the other parts I was thinking is the transfer learning as well. So the transfer learning, I think there's uh, from yesterday's machine learning sessions, we see several talks there, but also in our field, it's not applied or used a lot. So if you look at the industry in the last few years, I think one of the biggest success in industry um, actually using these large scale machine learning models is the transfer learning. So basically you train a model on large scale data sets, but then when you move to a task where you don't have enough data, only have a small data sets so you can actually fine tune in the model with these small data sets. So I think that's a really good way that if you don't have a, a, a large data sets like a, a lot of the cases in our fields. So this might be a way that you can test and uh, use machine learning. But I think we probably will see more and more research in this front as well. But also one last uh, uh, point is that uh, like in our field, I think right now there's more people, folks working on benchmark data sets and also like the um, the the uh, like a standard standardized uh, like a data format. I think this is to, to me this is also a frontier uh, frontier area because to push machine learning uh, forward uh, in a consistent way for different groups. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And the benchmark data sets are extremely valuable. So uh, yeah, thanks for that. Um, Carrie Ann, I'll let you take a crack at this. Yeah, well, I just want to sort of go back to the last thing that, that Tinkai said about um, sort of this, this notion of testing and benchmarking and putting together data sets. It's not the most exciting um, in terms of sort of research frontiers, like it's, you know, it's, it's not as flashy, but I think it's really going to be really important moving forward, thinking about things like how do we actually evaluate how these methods are performing? How do we think about the uncertainty of the, res the of, um, of the outputs that we're getting? Um, and thinking more critically about the evaluation as opposed to just, you know, having lots of papers throwing out different sort of slightly, slight variations on the same solution, really digging into seeing um, you know, how we can understand how they're performing and how they're generalizing what the uncertainty and where the failures are with these methods. Um, but there was also a lot of discussion in, earlier in, the, in this, um, under this question about this notion of kind of physics informed and physics layers. I think, um, so something that I've, I think is more a little, maybe take out a little bit more general is, I think incorporating domain knowledge more generally into uh, machine learning solutions is important. So I like that this term, I didn't come up with it, but I uh, heard it elsewhere. Um, of this idea of knowledge guided machine learning instead of physics informed, which I think I like that term because I think it better captures this notion of not all the domain knowledge we have can, can be written down as sort of a physical equation. It's not everything is a differential equation that we can write down and sort of code into our network. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity for thinking about other ways of bringing domain knowledge into machine learning. Um, so other kinds of domain knowledge that we could sort of embed. And also this idea of sort of having machine learning systems that are more interactive with human experts. So using things like active learning, um, where you're sort of actively get querying for labels from, from human experts, these kinds of areas, I think, could be really valuable in the sciences. Um, and I also am really excited about this notion of how machine learning can be used really for discovery going beyond automation. Um, and so some of the areas that I think are going to be important are something that's been mentioned as, you know, unsupervised learning techniques or semi-supervised learning techniques. Um, these techniques that allow you to find different and sort of unexpected patterns and structure rather than just looking at trying to reproduce patterns that you already know in your data. Um, and also the role that interpretability will play in that, having models where you can actually, you know, build a model that will model some complex system you don't understand and then somehow being able to try to dig in and understand, well, what is it, what patterns is it actually finding? And can that give us some insight about the scientific um, those sort of underlying science and processes. And so I think that's an exciting area as well. Yeah, that's great. And uh, this discussion is provoking lots of good comments in the chat that we're going to come back to. Um, but let's pivot. There are a couple other things that I want to make sure we touch on. 
Um, and maybe one of the most important is thinking about how do we integrate machine learning into our earth sciences curricula? And uh, go back to you, Carrie Ann, first for that. Yeah, um, so I think this is a really, uh, this is a question I'm excited to talk about. So I'm coming at a little bit different perspective in the sense of I don't actually have any degrees in geosciences, but, and this was my first semester teaching a course for geoscience students. So that's kind of the perspective I'm coming from, but I'm also coming from more of a data science background. And so I think there's kind of two different kinds of education that I see. And so the first is just getting sort of more general data science into geoscience, the geoscience curricula, making sure students have those sort of prerequisite courses to be able to understand um, and take more advanced data science courses if they want. So things like having basic linear algebra, basic statistics type of courses and learning some sort of basic programming beyond just MATLAB. Um, and so I think that these, they don't necessarily have to be, you know, each student doesn't have to take a linear algebra course, or a statistics course and taking these in like the, the math department. Um, they could be taught in sort of geo-specific integrated courses, but I think one of the limitations that I'm seeing now is a lot of these uh, students are picking these up sort of through other courses. So they're learning linear algebra by taking a physics course. And so they kind of have to pick it up in the course of learning physics rather than actually having a dedicated course where they're actually sitting down and learning linear algebra or learning statistics and same with programming. So I think that actually sort of in integrating it in an intentional way in the curriculum is gonna be important. Um, I think in terms of, in, of researching sort of um, toward getting people to do research in sort of data intensive computing within the geosciences. I have my sort of idea for this, and maybe this is a little bit controversial, is that I think that geosciences need sort of a computational biology. And what I mean by that is in um, sort of computer science, there's this field called computational biology, which is sort of the intersection of computer science and biology. And it's a field where you're training uh, students fundamentally as computer scientists who rather than working on data sets and problems in industry, work on data sets and problems in biology. But their training is really, they're really trained as computer scientists. And I think right now um, that could help with, um, in, in a lot of different ways. I think it creates pathways. There, there is a demand for this. I have people who reach out to me all the time. They really wanna do this. They really wanna be trained as a computer scientist and work on geoscience problems. And there's not a pathway. So I think having this be kind of a recognized discipline within the geosciences would really help um, it also is going to create sort of a, a body of knowledge to help educate, you know, the other students in just basic data science skills. Um, but it sort of gives students something they can point to and they can say, this is, these are the skills that I want to learn. Um, and so for me, I think that's something that I would like to see. It's sort of hard to, you know, get these, get excitement around this, but that's, um, that's what I would like to see be more recognized. Um, and then just another thing that I want to, um, you know, before I sort of turn it over to someone else is that I do think one thing that's for me important as this sort of new field of, sort of geo data science grows is to make sure that it's helping to enhance diversity within the geosciences. Because one thing that concerns me is that right now I see the sort of, you know, people who are working on more computational um, work within the geosciences. I think that group, that population is somewhat less diverse than the rest of the geoscience field. But there's no reason why it needs to be. Um, geoscience, we get a lot of, you know, sort of defectors from other uh, other fields. I get a lot of, uh, you know, young women who are approaching me. They're they're getting trained in computer science. They don't really feel welcome in that community. They love geosciences, and they would love to be working in geoscience in this space. And so I think it's something where, if we're really intentional about how we create these the curricula, how we bring people in, I think that this could be a way to help enhance diversity within the geosciences, as opposed to creating kind of a a bubble that's maybe less diverse than the rest of the field. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. Yeah, thanks, Carrie Ann. I think I hope uh, NSF and uh, and departments are thinking about this, and we break out of our stovepipe ways of thinking about uh, disciplines. Um, but great answer, uh, Ching Kai. Uh, how do we integrate machine learning into the geosciences uh, curricula? Sure. Yeah, I, I think I think I really love uh, Carrie Ann's idea of the computational biology uh, idea. So yeah, I totally agree on that based on my experience. Like I took a lot of uh, classes in computer science, but not aimed for like a earth science. It, it, it's not only be, it, it will be like really hard for our students to take a directly computer science classes, uh, lack of uh, earth science examples, but also like I think I think one big big problem is that like to to have this kind of classes that uh, aiming to uh, aiming towards the earth science we need our data sets we need our uh, 
uh, tools that to be accessible to the to the uh, computer science community, data science community as well. A lot of the times when I talk with folks at uh, data science uh, uh, institution at Berkeley, they want to get into more applications or more uh, research uh, uh, examples in earth science, but a lot of the times our data format and our uh, our problems framed are actually not as the standard as the data science community. So that's all, always I was thinking that like, for example, we use SAC a lot of our format and a mini seed and the data science community never knows what about these 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 uh, different uh, uh, format is and they have their standards uh, hdf5 or json and so on so i think that's like uh, maybe like in the future uh, we can we can also create uh, some of sort of like a uh, uh, consistent uh, platform that we can easily integrate these two parts into our uh, our classes and also i think like uh, our student for for the for the classes taking is one thing but the other thing is that uh, i encourage our students to um, to work out of our community and attend more of these joint uh, lectures, joint uh, seminars and workshops. Uh, I think a lot of the universities these days have the data science initiative and they are looking for people from various domains into the data science and as a dis interdisciplinary uh, collaboration. I think these kind of uh, opportunities are, are really good for, for our students to basically take advantage of. Yeah, thanks, Shinkai. And finally, let me give Daniel a chance to uh, answer this question. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think you know, these are good points so far, but I also I also think it's it's pretty important that you know if we're thinking about the you know universities across the country, across the world, um, to think very carefully about trying to establish some of their own classes, their own their own portion of the curriculum that's dedicated to um, data science, dedicated to machine learning, because. You know, if you rely on, you know, look, you know, if you have a student that's interested in machine learning and you just send them off to the computer science department to take their class, what's missing there is the all the domain expertise that you might get in applying to an earth science problem. Um, and so I think, you know, having these kind of earth science specific courses um, is really helpful, um, not only because sometimes it's hard, you know, just for a, a student out of the department to take a class in computer science, but it's also going to be much more relevant for them you know, later on in their career. And so I think, you know, universities and departments should, you know, look in investing in, you know, hiring people that can teach those classes, hiring people that have the capability or at least the interest in trying to teach those classes. But I think that's a really good way, you know, taking these types of formal classes is actually a, a really good way to um, learn the, you know, the important concepts behind machine learning kind of from first principles. And alongside that, also learning a lot of the drawbacks and the limitations of the methods and so you kind of know when to use it you know which problems is it the right tool and which problems is it not i think you know the risk is when when people are all kind of learning this on their own um there a lot of times you, you're drawn to the successes and not to the failures and that's something that a, a kind of a more structured curriculum can correct for by you know showing you know machine learning method failing spectacularly in some sort of problem that you might not be able to see you kind of pick it up on your own um, and I think I just want to circle back to the point that Carrie Ann was making about um, diversity, which is which is a really important one because you know right now we're at a little bit of a crisis point in diversity in the geosciences, um, and it's not entirely clear that bringing in more machine learning is is going to help at all. Um, you, you know I think a lot of um, fields it's it's not a very diverse field at all if you think about you know the types of people that are doing machine learning research. But I do, I do agree that it's potentially an opportunity because, you know, historically, geosciences has been a very field-oriented, um, you know, type of uh, field where it's not, you know, the, the barriers to entry are pretty severe and being able to give people, you know, more um, opportunities to, you know, maybe they're not so interested in doing field work, but they're interested in, um, you know, working from home or doing their um, computer science itself, it's a way to bring in experiential learning that's not limited to like the classic, you know, eight week field camp. So it's both kind of a potential obstacle and a potential opportunity. And so I think that's done correctly. There are ways that it can really expand our reach into, into you know, places all across um, academia, you know, to bring in, you know, students that may not um, know about or be interested in earth sciences at the outset, bring them in through the lens of 
um, data science is, is one avenue that we're interested in. Yeah, that's great. Uh, that's a, given us a, a bunch of things to think about and thinking about um, also uh, your comment about uh, documenting things that don't work. We kind of need that across the sciences. We're not very good about uh, writing up the things that don't work. <laughs> uh, so I wanna make sure we get a chance to get to the chat. So we're gonna to turn to that shortly, but let me ask you each one last question um, before we do that. And that question is kind of what's next for you? Uh, Daniel, let's go to you first. Yeah, for me, I mean, so I think a lot of us, maybe everyone um, on this panel is in a little bit of a transition point in their career. Um, and so, I mean, for me, what I'm most excited about, um, I'm not, I'm not, I don't get so excited about, you know, advances in machine learning algorithms. I get excited about um, opportunities to tackle new types of problems. And so for me, moving to a university, moving to a really big earth science department um, is allowing me to start collaborations on new types of science problems. So outside of my kind of domain knowledge background in observational seismology, I'm, you know, I'm starting to be able to work with, you know, people that are interested in glaciers and people that are, you know, working on, you know, Geodetic data sets, and so being able to expand my reach in that way, and having having the training that I have in the background that I have in data science and machine learning is helping me, you know, kind of break into these other fields that are really cool science problems, but I haven't had a chance to to get on. And so that's that's kind of what I'm excited about moving on to over the next five years or so. That sounds great. Yeah. Uh, how about you, Carrie Ann? Uh, yeah, I'm also sort of transitioning in, into a new position. Um, I guess in terms of from sort of the data science side, one of the things I'm interested in is, you know, we, we talked about some of these limitations of machine learning. And so thinking about how do you use machine learning in science given these limitations? So things like, you know, how do we put error bars on, on neural networks? How do we make sure that we're getting results that are more robust? How do we interpret the results so that we can see if they're consistent with domain knowledge? How do we put domain knowledge into them? These kinds of questions. Um, and then also I'm just interested in working with, with new kinds of data sets. Um, I think, you know, for data scientists, it's always fun to have new and, you know, different kinds of data. And I always like working on problems that are sort of less, have less sort of interest around them, like sort of strange problems. Like I really liked, when I was in the laboratory working on sort of bio threat agent detection, which is something no one works on, but I always find it fun to kind of work on like strange problems. So I'm always looking for like new strange problems to work on as well, so. Um, yeah. I'm glad somebody is working on bio threat detection. That's good. <laughs> good to know. I'm not, not working on it anymore, <laughs> but I just, I, I like those kind of weird problems that are not, you know, don't have a, a huge flood, you know, some, some problems you get, you know, you have a thousand PhDs on the same topic and I, I like working on these kind of um, a little great. bit different problems. That's great. Thanks, Kiryan. And uh, how about you, Shinkai? What's next for you? Sure, yeah, same here. I'm in the transition mode from academia and industry to national labs. One thing I, I think I'm really excited about is the large scale uh, machine learning applications. I think at national labs, you really have these uh, like a uh, big facilities, data, big data sets, and uh, the like to push this forward. This is one of the things I'm really excited in the future uh, for the next few years. But also the other thing um, I, I'm currently really interested in is to attack these models. So all these models are vulnerable, in my opinion, for a lot of these machine learning models we built and we think it works well on these training data sets, test the data sets. But I think there's some flaws there that these machine learnings, when you deploy it into the real world, all kinds of weird situation will happen. How to attack these models purposely that you can actually learn more about the failure of these machine learning models before you deploy it to some uh, critical facilities. I think that's something I'm, I'm really interested in as well. And also joining the force between geophysics and data science is always my interest. So that's always like, I, I always like to talk with folks from computer science and data science to learn their, their complaints, to learn, learn their like uh, advances as well. I think that's, that's something that I will continue to push that forward. That's great. Yeah, I agree. Um, so let's see, let's, I'd like to try to open this up now and we'll take a look at some of the questions coming in through the chat. Um, I took a, there's a lot uh, going on there, but maybe going back to um, something Keith Coper asked, uh, kind of why now, right? Some of us that have been around for a while, we've heard machine learning and artificial intelligence. What is it that just the advances in uh, computations that are uh, driving the 
interested in machine learning now or is there sort of more fundamental changes and who wants to take a crack at that first? Uh, let's go to um, uh, Daniel. Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's a, it's a really important question because, you know, this has been prime time for machine learning. This is like volume three, you know, we've seen this repeatedly in the eighties and the nineties. And now again, I think there, there are a few things that are a little bit different right now than they were in those kind of past um, high points in machine learning. I think the one big difference is the kind of the difference in the computational architectures, the availability of things like GPUs to be able to, you know, train very deep neural networks. That's, that's a, that's a big change. Um, and kind of hand in hand with that, the methodology to be able to, to train deep neural networks, that's a big change. Um, and, and so that's, that's one thing that's quite different. Another thing that's quite different is the, um, you know, just the availability of computing power to um, the masses and not just the specialists. And so you can, you can actually train quite effective machine learning algorithms on your laptop now, and that wouldn't have been the case 20, 30 years ago. And then the third thing that I see is different is the data availability. We have really large amounts of data, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a really important point because we've seen this before in that, you know, machine learning has gotten very, very, very hyped and has not been able to deliver. And it's not, it's not entirely clear whether we're on a, a wave that's growing or cresting. And so I think it's, it's useful to be humble about what's going on right now. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Karen or Chinkai, would you like to jump in and add to that? Sure, yeah, I can uh, follow up on uh, Daniel's answer. I think that's generally what I think as well, computation and data. And these two things really uh, boost the machine learning applications in our field. But also one, the other thing is that I think why now is because we see a lot of success in other fields as well. I think that's emphasized or echo with the, the people's interest here as well, especially in the, in the computer science or like in biology and in other fields that machine learning really helps us to, uh, to achieve a lot of the difficult uh, problems in the past that we never uh, dreamed of that we can solve them. Uh, I think that should basically motivate more folks in our field and it becomes more open-minded to accept all these tools, different tools in our field to uh, test it, yeah. Yeah. I guess I, I would just add that I think that it's, you know, the sort of growth and excitement around machine learning. I think this time also corresponds with sort of the growth of data science as this notion of this is sort of its own field and this the growth of sort of data scientists in industry and um, because, you know, it's, it's, I think that is an important difference this time as well, is it's not just machine learning, it's the general growth of data, the availability of data and computation sort of throughout society as well, and that these tools are getting to be easier to use, there's more data to use with them, and machine learning isn't the only set of tools, but it's one of the sets of, you know, it's one tool within data science, and it, there's been a lot of excitement around it because of the, the advances. Um, but I do think it's sort of part of a larger trend this time, uh, sort of, and I don't think it's a trend that's sort of going away. It's just a, um, you know, I'm, I hope it's here to stay because I think it's, um, you know, really um, valuable to be able to have those skills to analyze the data, whether it's using machine learning or some other, you know, statistical tool, big data techniques. Um, yeah, I, it, it definitely has a feeling uh, different than, than in some of the previous incarnations. Uh, and Maybe, so one of the questions that we talked about is uh, limits of data sets. Um, and Jessica Murray was asking about synthetic data. So maybe does somebody want to talk about the pros and cons of trying to train on synthetic data? Uh, how about, uh, Shinkai, let's jump to you. Sure, yeah, I can take on. Uh, on that side. yeah. So on synthetic data, I think it's really good. To, uh, one way is really good that you have a large data set, you can control the data set, you can generate and then you train the model and then you can very well evaluate your model and then to see what the uh, the performance of your model on this synthetic data. But, uh, but remember, synthetic data or synthetic data, it's not a, a fully representation of the real world data. I think that's usually the case that uh, uh, some models may work well on the synthetic data after training, but then later when you apply into the real world, there's some 
like all kinds of the problems related with that. So that's why I think like a synthetic data um, can can help like in training a good model, but it can't solve all the all the problems. But also like a synthetic data may introduce some bias as well. Like these bias, maybe we don't know uh, specifically, and uh, because when we when we generate this synthetics, so this is based on our uh, prior information of whether this model is good or bad. So when we when we generate all kinds of these synthetic data that if we don't pay attention to, we may introduce some like uh, systematic errors or systematic uh, uh, bias into these synthetic training data, which actually will propagate into your trained model and into the decision making. So I will stop here. Yeah, thanks, Chinkai. Does anyone else want to jump in on uh, commenting on synthetic using training using synthetic data? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think I think for I think synthetic data is useful in machine learning in the same way it's useful in you know traditional seismology. It's it's kind of only as good as your synthetic data is. If you have a really good way of generating very realistic synthetic data, it's great for machine learning. You can train your model. Your model is going to do well. If you have a very poor way of generating synthetic data, your model is going to learn that, and it's not going to learn how the real world works. And so it's the same way. You know, if we if we didn't have machine learning at all, um, you can use synthetic testing to test out you know different ideas to um, you know to explore the behavior of large earthquakes. Um, and if the if you if you're good at generating the synthetic data, it's a very useful exercise. And if you're not, it's not. Um, I think with the one one maybe slight quirk of machine learning is that there's there's often this kind of implicit assumption of self similarity in machine learning methods in the sense that a lot of the inputs that go into these machine learning models are normalized in some way. And usually that normalization is, is removing some sort of aspect of, you know, the earthquake being large, you know, you're normalizing the waveforms to some, you know, scale invariant value so that you can plug it into your model. Um, and so there's a little bit of a risk in machine learning and applying it to earthquakes of different sizes if they don't, if they're not scaling, um, consistently. Um, and so, for example, if you have some, if you have a training data set that is dominated by a bunch of small earthquakes, um, it might, it might kind of apply to a large earthquake, you know, after some normalization, but it, it also might not if there's something fundamentally different about the physics of the large earthquake. And we have, you know, some ideas about, you know, differences in the, you know, physical processes, differences in friction um, at high slip speeds, for example. Um, that you know might break that self similarity. So there's always this risk in machine learning when you're kind of bridging across scales. Right. Uh, I don't know, Carrie Ann. Do you want to? Yeah, I'll just add briefly. There is some literature in the computer science community about trying to learn from synthetics and trying to learn kind of a a shared embedding of the data that or shared representation where you can sort of learn from synthetics. And but I don't know how much that's. I haven't seen that applied that much to scientific applications, but. Um, but it is something, you know, if you're interested in, there, there is some literature out there on that topic. Yeah, thanks. One of the comments in the chat, uh, Yuri Berman talks about when do we go from research to production? And there's actually is machine learning being used in production in some cases. And I don't know if anybody wants to comment about, um, about that. I know, for example, uh, Shinkai, that you uh, had made some use of that in some of the work you were doing for the shake map and other things. Yeah, I, I can I can comment on that. Yeah, I think I think like for machine learning research and going into production is totally different um, because like on research you can get gathering a training data set and testing data sets works really well, and that's like what we saw like in, in based on our experience before like when we train the machine learning model in uh, MyShake it works really well on paper and uh, on the training data sets. But uh, like ninety four percent successful rate, but when we release the model into reality, so uh, it, it deployed that into reality. So the the test score or like the accuracy drop uh, uh, drop like to seventy percent, which which is like a, a lot by the standards. The reason is that like in the training and uh, in the uh, testing uh, stage, that you actually can't know. Uh, whether the, the it captures all the situations or the distributions in the real world, I think we need more 
uh, intensive stress test before we do this like a deployment. And also in deployment, I think one limitation for machine learning is that uh, uh, it's hard to debug because of the black box uh, nature, when you have the performance, machine learning performance on the long tail of your distribution not well, sometimes you don't know what's going on in the model that makes this uh, this wrong. I think that's the, all the strategies. That's good to think about. Yeah, thank you. Unfortunately, this is a great discussion and uh, I wish we could keep going, but we are at the end of our hour. So I really want to thank our guests again. Uh, Dr. Chinkai Kang, uh, Dr. Daniel Trugman, and Dr. Carrie M. Bergen, thank you very much for uh, joining me in this fireside chat. Uh, I hope uh, everyone found it interesting. Um, there's chances to ask uh, all of our panelists questions later uh, in the meeting and in the, uh, uh, the social hour on Thursday that was coming up. Um, so thank you again, and uh, hope everybody has a great rest of the SSA meeting. Thank you. Bye.